I V M. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of This Round is on Me. So here's my weekly roundup of the roller coaster ride that being a restauranter continues to be and to leave you with some food for thought. This week we got some fantastic news. The table has been nominated for a World Culinary Award in the category of India's best restaurant for 2021. Woohoo! Just the motivation we need to keep plodding along despite the mad times we find ourselves in. Now I do ask whether this is the best time to be pitting restaurants against each other and whether annual awards are really necessary considering we've been closed most part of the year but for me it's something else entirely it's an endorsement of the hard work of many many years and not just about the last one year so I'm going to still put it out there please vote for us using the link in the episode note and a big thanks in advance from me and the team to those of you who do Speaking of team, I had a really interesting chat with my head of operations yesterday. So you know I've talked about this before. We unfortunately had to close one of our restaurants down um when lockdown hit you know, last year. Um but we decided to redo it slightly and relaunch hopefully fingers and toes and everything crossed um next month if all goes to plan and I'm almost eating my words as I say them out loud because hey what plan right? Um but anyway we've begun hiring for this project and incidentally there are quite a few of our ex team members who now work with other restaurants that you know may have closed or be closing and um who are now sort of potentially looking for work and uh, as we were chatting about this my first reaction was to say you know i don't want anyone who ditched us to join someone else you know without either giving us the opportunity to match their offers or you know they lied to us about where they were going and ended up with the competition etc i guess i'm still a bit hurt and i feel betrayed and you know i mean who doesn't expect loyalty right but how silly is that in fact the better approach is to be completely unemotional think about what's best for the business right and what's better than having known devils who already know the drill and don't need to be trained from scratch so that was actually a big learning for me last week when i was having this conversation and i just thought i'd share that with you so as i leave you with that thought we'll take a quick break before i introduce my guest today a star we've all undoubtedly come across as we've spent hours binging on Netflix, Amazon and Hotstar. So stay tuned. Hey everybody, welcome to another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. I'd like to thank the sponsors on the network this week, Cred and Sia. Thank you so much for making this possible. We've had an amazing week on the network. Do check out the note with Maruti Nair. She speaks to Prabhat Kumar, the man leading child protection at one of India's leading NGOs, Save the Children. On the Habit Coach, Ashton was joined by Rajat Mittal Shah to talk about some superfoods in Ayurveda like turmeric and ashwagandha. On Pesa Vesa, host Anupam Gupta has a digital gold special in two parts: one with Ashraf Rizvi, founder and CEO of Digital Swiss Gold, and Gilded, and one with Deepak Abbott, co-founder of India Gold. Listen to the first part of the Father's Day special of Agla Station Adulthood with Rasha and her father, Dr. Vipul Roy Rathore. You should also check out Cyrus Says's episode with Mukul Chadda. He talks about upcoming shows Sunflower and Sherni. Our Kannada podcast, Thalaya Rates, celebrates a hundred episodes, and we had a reunion of hosts Pawan, Ganesh, and Surya, who shared their favorite moments from the past. Shiva Mehta is back with the second season of Smile India. The show is available in both English and Hindi. On this episode, she talks about the conversion from bag teas to bagless ones, and how we should ditch the plastic and have a great tea experience. And with that, let me get you back to your show. Welcome to the show. This round is on me. Today I have a very dear friend whom I met for the first time sitting at the community seating at the table following which she happened to be the celebrity who presented us our very first award ever at the Time Out Restaurant Awards Poona Jagannathan is an American actress and producer of Indian descent she's best known for her portrayal of Safar Khan in the HBO mini series The Night Off as well as playing the lead in the Bollywood cult comedy film Delhi Belly She also initiated and produced the play Nirbhay which dealt with breaking the silence about sexual violence. 
Nirbhai won the 2013 Amnesty International Award and was called by The Telegraph as one of the most powerful pieces of theatre you'll ever see. I, I saw it and I couldn't agree more. Puna is currently a series regular in the Netflix teen comedy series, Never Have I Ever, and is recurring in the Apple TV crime drama miniseries, Defending Jacob. Puna, we're finally doing this. You gave me a good chase, man, in true celebrity style, huh? <laughs> this Listen. just literally feels like we're in your house playing I know, pretend. Like I know. It's ridiculous. I know. I wish, so I wish. I know. I wish we were actually in the same house, but uh, soon, soon. Listen, I have to tell you, I every single time we see you on the screen, we all get super excited. We all like screen grab it. We're all like screaming and yelling. And and we are still like, I've seen her, like even after meeting you like 20 times. <laughs> what is Poona um, auntie doing? I know. She That's looks so familiar. funny. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> but anyway, listen, um, thank you again for being here. And- oh my God. God, what I a know. pleasure. We don't do this this way. I mean, we what's we we talk all the time, but I haven't I seen you, right? I know. I know. Well, well, in person soon as well, I hope. Indeed. But um okay, so listen, I want to talk to you about things that we don't normally talk about when we chat. Um We don't and... we talk about this stuff? I feel like this is the stuff that we talk about all the time. I want to get to know you better, Puna. All right. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so listen, let's start with your childhood. Uh, let's start at the beginning. And um, I know you've always talked about moving around um, a lot, because I guess I think that was the nature of your father's job. Um, and so you moved cities a lot. And, you know, you you really had a very different childhood from um, one like mine, which was pretty much growing up in one country, one city. Did this sort of moving around every few years, you know, really affect who you are and your, um, you know, what's your connect with, where do you connect with? Tell us about that. I think the last, uh, so I moved back from India six years ago now. Mm -hmm. And I think the last six years has been me really uh, unlearning everything I learned in childhood. Um, not everything. I, I, I'm learning a lot of what I learned in childhood. So, um, you know, there's so many benefits to moving around. We actually moved around every two and a half, three years. So, and within that, we were moving houses, um, you know, every year in, in this totally bizarre uh, lifestyle. And of course, it is, you know, the positives are, you know, I, I, I speak many languages, not from books. It's like I speak langu- languages because I've lived there. My body language changes when I'm in another country. I can adapt super quickly, like all those wonderful things. But, you know, what happens is you get the opportunity to completely reinvent yourself. And, you know, not confront yourself every two and a half years. So all the mistakes you make, you can... You get a fresh start. One second. <laughs> you get a, it's like nobody knows you. Yeah. <laughs> you get a fresh start. So like as an adult, um, just having to, you know, when you are in a very particular, when you stay put, you end up having to confront First of all, the huge benefit of staying put is for the first time, I have a very strong sense of home, Mm -hmm. which I have never had. I've always been searching for a sense of belonging and like countries like Brazil, like I landed, I knew I belonged there, but not, you know, it's still not mine. But um, what happens is we've been here for six years and suddenly I have a home and I have like, I know what exit to get off of the free, like it's all very familiar to me. And it's a simplicity of home that I've never had. It's the routine of home that I've never had, which is really amazing. And, you know, when I say unlearning, it is really confronting the fact that you have to confront the mistakes you make and have nowhere to run and you have to clean up your messes and all that stuff, like stuff that people learn to do as children, but I never learned. It sounds like it really set you up for a, a life in acting, actually, because right. um, <laughs> you you kind of um, get to play different roles in different places. And um, so you try on different, speak different accents, know, characters. <laughs> yeah. 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 
Um, totally. no, but that's amazing. Being but more actually- mysterious. Like that was the biggest thing. Like, how can I be even more mysterious? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, speaking of acting, I mean, that wasn't the first shot at a career when you graduated from um, college because you, in fact, graduated in journalism. Is that right? Yep. And then... And then I know that you um, you had a career in market research for the yes. longest time. 15 um, years. Just 15 years, yeah. And, um, and I just gave it up. When I say just, I mean just. just? Like I'm not saying last <laughs> weekend, but I'm saying pretty just. <laughs> wow. Um, it sounds a little bit like me jumping from... Um, making yeah. the natural yes. progression from accounting to restauranting. Yes. So, yes. Um, but like, take us yeah. through that uh, that that trajectory a little bit. Um, I mean, I think it was a, a, a not a very oblique uh, trajectory. It was a it's a and maybe typical because it was a brown girl, you know, wanting to get into the arts without, you know without her parents knowing and why that um, why why without them knowing was it was it kind of considered rebellious and a waste I of didn't time? even bother to find out what it was considered <laughs> I didn't I yeah. didn't I didn't even get on that train it was it was just not going to happen I mean um you know I pretty much had to put myself um you know through my through my education, of course, my parents help me as much as they can, but there is no way that anyone is ponying up for a degree in theater. There's no scenario where I could possibly ask them to sc- all the money that they squirreled away to put it into a theater degree. I probably couldn't even do it of myself, frankly. But is that why you did journalism or did you actually, you know, at that point really want to pursue journalism? No, I felt like I had a trajectory mapped out really early, which is, um, you know, I met a lot of people who were in advertising and in the arts. So like I met Alik Padamsi when I was really young and I was like, oh, okay. So just like the second, this, my A and B plan were always bound intrinsically together. Um, I didn't think my A plan would go for so long. (laughs) (laughs) But my A plan and my B plan have been like like tra- train tracks. Yeah. And uh, it's been the weight of how much I'm on track A uh, versus track B has just shifted over. So I did a lot of advertising and very little acting. And I do a lot of acting and very little <laughs> advertising. But yeah. that's it. You know, the wonderful thing about advertising is it's a very, very supportive community. It is a community of artists. Um, I have a lot of lifelong friends. And when I did make the transition, they all came together to support me. You know, they'd all give me jobs to help me pay my rent and do whatever they could for me. My last gig, I remember, because, you know, God, I, I moved here and I didn't have a job when I moved back. I had yeah. nothing, you know. But that's the thing, right? With a lot of, I've seen this with a lot of like theater personalities is that it's it starts off being like this hobby that you do that you really want to pursue, but it doesn't pay the bills. And so you still have yeah. to have that. Um, yeah, you have to. That, that serious job kind of thing. Yeah, You have to have that job. And, you know, the worst thing, like this was very true for my, for what I was seeing is like roles I didn't want to play. I didn't, I, and I still don't want to play. I still don't want to play that role for an Indian woman, be it like the wife of a terrorist or the wife of a, you know, I, or the, the mother the of doctor. this or the, <laughs> the doctor, like the doctor, like, no, a completely side. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to do that. And I was like, I don't have to, if I can barely make rent, but still making it, I didn't, I felt like I could, you know, I feel like my career has been completely built on a mountain of no's versus yeses. Mm-hmm. Um, and I could afford to uh, let a lot of opportunities by because I did not have that crazy fear that happens when literally your rent is due and you have you have yeah. nothing. Yeah. No, I mean, but tell me, I mean, just going back a little bit, at yeah. what point did you realize that you wanted to be an actor? Like, how did that happen? Was it something that you were doing in school? And then... What? No, I never of, did anything. So, so how? No. Like, and w- like, what triggered that 
first so gig? So I was nine years old and I met an actress and I don't know what her maiden name was, but she is her, her married name is Suhasni Mani Ratnam. Have you heard of her? She's a mm-hmm. South Indian actress. You know, there's a director called Mani Ratnam. Oh, yeah. 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 And so it's uh, his wife is a oh, very, very accomplished okay. actress. And I don't know. Well, I do know my uncle is a very good friend of her dad, I guess. And so when we were in Chennai one day, I I just happened to go over. I was really, I think I was actually six or seven. Wow. And I met Suhasini and we had like an instant connection She's really great with kids. And I had just gone over with my uncle for, you know, whatever, a coffee or whatever. And I stayed maybe a week at their house or a week and a half. (laughs) And um, with no intention of ever leaving, really. (laughs) And I think um, Suhasi's sister used to live, still is a doctor in Ireland. And I lived in Ireland at the time that I met her. So I had a very thick Irish accent and... Um, and I went to set with her every day and I was like, what? I can't imagine you with an Irish accent. People. <laughs> Wait, can you just like rewind on that? Wait, did you not know? No one could understand me because I had the thickest Irish accent. What? Can you do it again? <laughs> well, you know, because I went to Ireland with Nirbhaya and it all just came back. Oh my God, that is so strange. That people thought there was like a local person in the cast. <laughs> So when I do, like, I can't do any accents, but when I go to that place, like when I'm in... You just uh, slip like, right into it. I slip into a, oh into my a God. very different <laughs> accent. Um, Sorry, so you were yeah. saying, yeah, so you, you stayed with her and you... Um, I, I was completely, like, bes- I just didn't know what she was doing, but it looked amazing. And there was, I still remember there was a crying scene and they asked her if she wanted glycerine. She's like, no, I got this. <laughs> she, she just went for it. I was like, this, I used to, I, I remember writing her letters about the scenes that I saw on the set. I was, I was just like, this is the best place on earth. Um, and then I never met an actor again for maybe 25 years. Mm-hmm. But there were probably there was some like um, fairy dust that yeah. happened around then, and then you know I don't I don't know I I'm I always think of it you know I grew up not I grew up in sometimes a strict household sometimes a lenient household but my father wouldn't quite encourage us to talk so even now I know you don't know me as shy or nothing but. Um, I can be very shy. It can be really hard for me to form words. It can be hard for me to talk. Um, so I, I always felt like acting was a way to use other people's words to talk instead of using mine. It just felt like a, a safer way to myself. And that's why I think Nirbhaya really helped me get into my own body and my own thoughts and my own activism, put, put ideas together, which I never had before. Mm-hmm. But I do think acting just helped me or, or was a way for me to express without having to use my own words. Right. And I mean, as you kind of, you know, took it um, further as a profession, uh, you started yeah. your career in Hollywood. Is that right? Which shows? In- I mean, New York, it's, it's yeah. you know, it's just New York, you know, like you, if you're a New York actress, you're doing a a law and order couple you, have of, you know to. there were like it's like a rites of passage order. right you yeah. just you are doing that there were like tv shows called rescue me and i did rescue me i have to find clips of these before i drop the episode <laughs> oh, i mean this is don't. amazing <laughs> um, don't. but you know and then and then no, you actually models. no yeah. i mean no look i'm it, it's amazing and um it, it, was, it was it's almost uh strange because you did the the reverse of what everyone in india does which is that you uh, went uh, into uh, bollywood after cracking hollywood and uh that's really not I, not the, I did not, <laughs> nothing I did not about crack you ever normal um Puna, but <laughs> how did that happen um because usually of uh, course it is the other way around I mean, I would never have done a more, I wouldn't say never, but, you know, Delhi belly is so atypical Bollywood. Yeah. Um, And I, uh, I just, I, it's one of my favorite scripts still today. It is one of the 
Most, really it's, it's funny. It's a top film. It is just, it's a classic. I mean, it's a, it's it's a, a film that no one's forgetting anytime soon. And um, what mean, a way, imagine. right, to make an entry into, into yes. Bollywood. Yes. I mean, all the things I think that were considered, I didn't, you know, I, 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 um, I don't know if you know the story, the, the way that I was in India is because I won a blackjack um, thing. What? I don't know what it's, yeah, so I was, I was playing blackjack and I guess I won. I don't even know what the game's about, but I guess I won. And I, the, the winner of Got a the trip highest, to India. was a trip to India. You're joking, which, right? No, which I got. Are you just Azad making this I, up? Is this like a little like fiction no, movie no. <laughs> script? So Azad and Av and I get to India for my cousin Deepa's wedding, who you've met. And while I was with Deepa on a day off, I met my friend Arjun Basin, who I know from New York. And he was like, I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm working on a movie called Delhi Belly. He was doing the costumes back then. He was like actually they may be a part for you. And then he <laughs> called someone and have an audition the next day. And I walk into the audition and um, sitting there is a very close friend of mine from New York called Samrat. We did not even know we were in India together. And so I asked to do the audition with him. Thank God. And uh, there's a couple of scenes, including the hotel scene where I fake, fake sex, have fake sex mm-hmm. with Iran. So I, first of all, it's really great comedy, right? So there's nothing, for me, there's nothing sexual about the script at all. Um, so, but I do the scene and apparently no one did that part in the audition. Right. Like everyone stopped right before it or something. Meanwhile, I, like that was the only part I'd, <laughs> you know, think of doing. Like what, what else are you going to do? Um, so long story short, it was complete, complete, like one thing after the other, which is just complete serendipity. Like just this one weird thing after the other that uh, led me to do Daily Belly. And the writer is from LA and we ended up knowing a bunch of people in common and is still a very, very dear friend of mine. And we're still working on projects together. That is incredible. And I mean, you know, after working on shows in the States, was it really, really different as a in terms of work culture or just the way the whole production worked? I want to say yes. Uh, but since then, I've had a lot of cluster f- experiences on sets here. And then I'm like, you know what? It's kind of comparable. Mm-hmm. I mean, I worked on only two movies and one was Amir Khan and one was Dharma. So both were intensely high caliber and, you know, the directors knew what they were doing there's definitely like labor is definitely cheap you can like you can just tell the amount of people to do oh, one oh, specific, the spot yeah. boy surrounding you the, and <laughs> the spot boy your battalion has, of spot boys <laughs> i know like one task you know there there is that um there's really uh, n- not much hierarchy here. You know, the, the person working the spot boy will eventually, she or he will become a director. Do you know what I mean? There's the, the, the hierarchy here is very different in, in the level of respect. It is a whole different thing. But um, in terms of work ethic, and I, I found it, it is pretty similar. I mean, on Ye Giovanni, there was a scene where it was being written like the night before, and I had to do it as you do, (laughs) as you do. It was on a boat and I was speaking Hindi. I was like, this is really not going to work out that well for me. But um, I think what was interesting in India were more the projections and uh, which were really funny and fantastic. Like, that's what I really appreciate about India. Does it happen on like WhatsApp? (laughs) Well, first of all, casting happens on WhatsApp. Like there's, you know, there's no way a casting director would reach out to me directly here, but there it's like, hey, just, hey, what's up? <laughs> I'm on WhatsApp and we're casting. Um, but it was more like, I, I just remember being offered a film. We, like we were like, Kung Ho, and the producer's like, you know what? We've thought about it. We just want to go with someone more beautiful, like 50% more beautiful. <laughs> like I like stuff like that. I'm like, you Go for that. Yeah, just, just go cut for to the it. chase, right? I, mean, I like it. Yeah, I go for someone 50, 60 even percent more. Be- I think he may have said 60, not 50. Or there was this fantastic, I mean, when I say fantastic, I was like, 
what is this script that, uh, you know, I got a call and I met her at Bagel Shop and I read the script and I was like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. <laughs> I was so excited. And she's like, I want to offer, she's a writer. I want to offer you the part of this, you know, and it's a small part. And I was like, this is it's literally one of the most amazing parts I've ever read. I was so enamored. And um, it turns out she had changed the names to Indian names, but plagiarized the script from Donnie Brasco word for word. I'm not even joking. So what happened? When I say word for word, I mean, <laughs> you cut and paste. She cut and paste and changed the, I mean, you know, so, so, I mean, those conversations went really like, we were having coffee every week for like, I don't know how long, you know? So stuff like just psychos. <laughs> <laughs> just f***ing psycho after a f***ing psycho stories. And at some point I was like, I'm not going to work here. It's not going to work out for me. It's not, it's not good for me. Um, you know, I was, we were lucky enough to only survive on Azad's income. So I didn't have to work like I do here. Um so I was like, I'll just take a script that I, you know, that, you know, initially I was like, I'm just going to take scripts that love. And then it was like, you know what? I'm going to take scripts that make sense. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to take scripts that don't have typos. And then I was like, I'm just going to take a script that's original. And even those, like even nothing happened. And there were none. And then there were none. <laughs> nothing happened. And, you know, it's changed. India has changed. But when I moved there, I was maybe 30 maybe even close to 40. I was maybe, I know I celebrated my 40th birthday with you um, in Alibag, but um, there, it was a different market. This was uh, maybe 10 years ago. So the fact that I was married and like 40 and had a child, like it was over. Over the hill um, and how? <laughs> and how, like wheelchair bound. So then I said, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to go for any, I'm, it's not going to happen. Um, so then I started auditioning back here, back, living in India, but I started auditioning for stuff in the States. Mm -hmm. Like, so I remember that. Um, yeah. yeah. And so stuff like the night off I shot in the States, but I was living in India. Yeah. I mean, I that was stuff. an incredible show, really. I mean, what a way to make a comeback to the U.S., right? And I guess... It was a I good mean, show. Yeah. Um, and I don't blame you for then wanting to move back and have more of where that came from. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there wasn't that much more of where that came from, frankly. I think, you know, coming back was really, really challenging. It was a huge risk that may not have paid off at yeah. all, you know, and I uprooted Azad and he had a wonderful job there and it was tough. It was really tough. I, I, you know, there were definitely the first year I was like, I don't know, but you know, I did advertising. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yes. So my my last always advertising. advertising. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, I'm going to plug and play. No problem. My last, I remember one of my last gigs. Um, I have a very dear friend uh, to Mick and Hugh and, I was like, I can't make rent this month. It's not, it's not happening. Can you help me out? So they were like, you know, there is a job. Just like, you know, and I was like super senior Can by the time I left. Some market research on yeah. the streets of LA. This was even worse. He was like, could you, there's a big meet. I was living in LA. He's like, can you come too? I will fly you to New York. Can you be the scribe for a really big meeting? Like, can you take notes on a big <laughs> notepad? I mean, like, and I was like, he's like be the spot boy for her. Be spot boy. And I, he, and literally, I was like, of course I can. <laughs> Cut to, I get there. It's a huge pad. It's one of the biggest. It's a huge, like, money. You know, I, I'm almost sure it was Citibank. Like a huge, everyone global Citibank is around the thing. It's me, like, you know, taking notes and like putting stuff. To, what I did not tell them is, I don't know if you've seen my handwriting. I was going to say, can you shorthand or no? I cannot write. I, <laughs> like, it's, it's not, I couldn't even be a doctor. Like, it's, it's, like, even I cannot, I cannot read my own. I don't even try to read my own writing. I don't know how to spell. And then I was like, okay, this is not working out. So then I started drawing stuff. And I only could draw, like, symbols of money. And things that look like 
boxes. Like that's the only thing on the board. So then I turned the easel pad around so no one could see it and was just writing like rubbish. <laughs> the best gig I've that literally, I mean, that's that's what I was doing. Look, you paid rent. End. That's what matters, right? I paid rent you that met month. Rent that month. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Oh, and, and in the middle middle of that meeting, I got a another. I got a series regular on a show in the middle of the meeting during our break. You were like, "I'm out of here." You take your own notes. <laughs> I told, so I told Mick, I was like, "I just got this gig." He's like, "Just leave. You're totally useless. <laughs> no one. It's embarrassing. Just leave." So I left. Brilliant. <laughs> Listen, I mean, with, yeah. with all of this, I can't sort of now imagine how you put together a show like um like Nirbhaya. And you know, yes. it I mean that was something that I, I remember going to watch it in Bombay and well, um, And you were also deeply involved in, you know like seeing how it was put together. I remember the first, one of the first meetings with Yael, that long brainstorm meeting was in your home. Yeah. And, you know, I, I remember the entire audience basically when, when it ended was just in tears. And, you know, I remember when you asked the audience, you know, if, if, how many people had experienced some form of um, sexual sexual abuse and yeah. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm most of the audience put their hand up and people were like, you know, moved to tears. And I mean, what, what a, um, you know, what an achievement that was um, for you guys to, to put that together and you took it all over the world. You know, how is it? And and you produced this, you weren't just Mm -hmm. um, playing a Mm -hmm. role in here. You produced it with Yael and different from you as an actor. um, You know, is it a completely different, do you have to kind of, switch into a different mindset as with your producer. Yeah, I mean, it, I was really grateful to have had those years in advertising because I was fundraising and you just, you know, you have to know how to put things together, you know, you know, in terms of writing, in terms of pitching, in terms of, you know, who your audience is, everything. So I'm hugely, hugely grateful in, in my, to my, you know, massive, many, many years of business experience to put that together. And the networks that I had through advertising, Everyone came through. Every, every single person I know in advertising came through for me uh, during the fundraising time and uh, just logistics. And, you know, that was especially true in New York where everyone just rallied. Yeah. And it taught me more about acting than anything else has in my life. And I would probably say the second thing that comes close is probably never have I ever. And it's because I have such a sense of ownership around Nirbhaya which you should around any and every project, even if it's not yours, you should have a total sense of ownership. Um, and What do you mean uh, by that? You, I mean, tell us, that sort of, can you break that down a bit? You know, I always had the sense of, of being a, a guest on a set. Like, this is not my set. I'm just here, you know, to do the small part. Um, even though these lines may not work, it's not my place to, you know, come up with it. I may like improv a little bit to make it a little, you know, better, but, oh, this prop seems totally off, but I'm going to go with it. Basically don't, you're just coming there and you're not disturbing. You're not daring to disturb anything. You're just plug and play, right? And I think a lot of actors are like that. You know, when even if you get to a set, and, you know, a director will tell you, hey, why don't you like stand here, pick up this, pick up like, you know, they'll actually direct you. Um, and then here comes near, my experience with Nirbhaya, where you are every move you see on stage, I can tell you the story behind that move, right? How we all created it. And I have never fired on all cylinders like I, I have during Nirbaya. Like, uh, not, I mean, as a producer, as an actor, uh, you know, we uh, obviously, Yael wrote and directed, but it was intensely collaborative. So just and also everything. It was, it was real stories, right? It was, yeah, it was my story and the stories yeah. of uh, four other women. So uh, that's the other thing, like just giving off yourself fully, giving of your life and your experience fully. I've never dared to do that either, right? And uh, another huge lesson is we changed, you know, especially when we were touring in, in England, we would change venues every two days 
and there would be something or the other about the venue. And I'd be like, oh, this venue doesn't have this and it's tripping me up and oh, it's tripping me up. And slowly realizing like, that's your venue. That audience is going to see it in this venue only once. So this is your venue. This is all you have. And beginning a really a journey, a lifelong journey to completely embrace every space mm. and own it, not be a guest, not complain about it, own it. Um, you know, once we were, we were on stage and we didn't think it, think twice, but the, um, the, tra- the deaf and dumb, uh, interpreter, the speech interpreter, we should have put her on the other side of the stage. We put her on the side of the stage that had a lot of action. So while everything's going down, there's this interpreter right next to you, you know, and that was really, I remember that really tripped us up and soon stuff like that stopped tripping me up. It just, everything stopped tripping me up. So really the understanding that it's, you owe so much to the audience. You owe everything to the audience and they don't give a a shit about, you know, the stage is not perfect. They don't give a shit that they're there for you. Um, So, you know, taking that lesson to Never Have I Ever, which I felt so empowered on as an actor in terms of writing, in terms of, you know, um, directing. In, and, and it's not that I'm doing the directing. It's just really empowered to say I'm coming on set and just figuring it out for myself and being able to be and stay in your own body and saying, you know, this doesn't feel right or these are not the words I'd use. And just um, owning mm. something that is officially not yours, but you... Make um, it yours. You make it yours and you are, uh, you, it's, it's a very collaborative set. It make, it's easy to um, make it yours. It, you know, I've been on sets, which that was impossible. Um, but to feel like it, it is part of you as well, that you're not yeah. a guest, which is also, you know, because of my upbringing, I'm, I'm, I always have a whole guest narrative going on. Um, but, you know, even in terms of props, like I am, I, I, every, every day before I go to things, I look at the thing, I say, oh, these are the props. And then I'll take props from home and put it into the scene. Like there's a scene where I'm in, I, I won't give it away, but I'm holding up, you know, I pick up a puckered, you know, the, mm-hmm. is it called puckered? Yeah. You know, <laughs> you've never uh, used one of those before, have you? <laughs> I'm totally, I'm totally cooking and never have it. You know, you, you make me look good in the kitchen. I just want you to know that. Just by the I way. have changed, Corey. I want to tell you that. I've completely changed. I am now. I have to eat cook. to believe. Poor not. It's good. It's good. It's only five dishes, but it's good. <laughs> well, it's four more than me. Um, No, so yeah, you, <laughs> you were saying that um, no, I just picked up the pucker yeah. from the house and put it into the scene. Like, yeah. I was like, oh, okay, this is what I'm going to take. And so, you know, con- and then, you know, even the um, the costumes, like, oh, my God, they're all, you know, again, it, it it is the fact that our costume designer, Salvador, is so collaborative and so open. Mm-hmm. But I have, you know, not only Anita and Pyle Kanvala from last year, but we have Ikai. We have um, wow. Kuyana. We have a bunch of like amazing Indian designers in there that um, that I sourced and introduced. And they were like, yeah, let's do it. So it just is a very, what happens to work when you put all of you in mm. it? it, it is a, it's a very different experience. It's exhausting. I was exhausted for two years after Nirvaya, but um it's worth it. I'm sure you feel that way about the restaurant. Absolutely. I mean, I was just going to say, I think that people connect with it so differently when they mm-hmm. see that there's, you know, like, I mean, I hate to use this word, but that there's like authenticity behind it. And there's, um, you know, that it is you. And that's what they connect with. You know, they're not connecting with a thing or... Uh, you know just it's it's connecting with people and even if the people aren't there it comes through right so even for me at the restaurant I'm not there 24 7 but I still get people messaging me and you know they they know that we've played a part a very integral part in whatever that experience is that they've had and it's not just some kind of cookie cutter Yes. And it's also like, I've been thinking about this, like, how do you make your presence felt even when you're not there? Absolutely. Yeah. How do you Um, know that you're, yeah. 
Yeah, no, I I completely agree with you. But I always sort of put it down to an amazing team. And you've had the opportunity, you know, with Never Have I Ever and even, you know, with The Night Off and with all these, even Delhi Belly, like working with incredible people, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. you're working with Mindy Kaling, you work with Riz Ahmed, you, you know, with, with obviously Amir Khan's team in, yeah. in India. And, you know, wh- what is, um, how does that, kind of impact you I mean are you now is that a big decision making factor for you in terms of whom you're going to be working with and it's not just about the role and what have you learned from working with these incredible people in this industry I have worked with incredible talent there was one scene in the night of where uh, there was not one person in the room that hadn't either won an Academy Award or was not made for <laughs> an Academy Award. Like, I, like I still remember that. And Riz and I, because Payman had already won, yeah. Riz and I were like, uh, okay. And now Riz is just nominated. So, you know, it's just down to me now, looking around in that room. I will tell you the one thing that draws me more and more is how kind some people are, no matter who they are. Like Mindy Kaling is extraordinarily kind. Riz Ahmed is a blazing talent, and extraordinarily kind. Um, and I, I do think it may be a function of my age because that's become the most important thing for me for, for to see, uh, to work with people who are kind. I cannot bear to be on sets that are unkind. I don't have the bandwidth for that. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, I, it, it allows you to uh, be a lot more uh, selective about what scripts you get and what partnerships you go with. But it, I can't describe it. It is, it is, uh, it, it is unbelievable to see people at the top of the game that but are then just- is it, is it ever intimidating for you? Intimidating? If it's into, I mean, the answer is, of course, I'm not, I'm not like, oh, is it? In-? Of course it's intimidating, but. Um, you were in a scene with Meryl Streep, weren't you? <laughs> in- I totally. Sorry. I'm sorry. You know what? I totally blacked that out because I was so intimidated, actually. <laughs> yeah. like- you know what? I know. I totally, bl- I was so intimidated. And not only that, the day before I met Nicole Kidman, I watched all her movies, but unfortunately I watched a bunch <laughs> of her Australian stuff. So when I open my mouth, which is what happens to me. I had an Australian accent. She was like, have we ever met in back, yeah. back, back down under? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, and then I just So sh- what was I that like? I mean, I, I was literally like jumping Extra- on my bed watching that. Literally extraordinarily kind. One of the kindest people I've met. And those are the experiences I remember. You know, I've, I've definitely met some massive, massive, amazing big wigs. And if they were anything but, I have no desire to work with them. I don't, I don't remember them. But the, you know, they, um, like Nicole Kidman is, um, she's extraordinary. I've never been in an acting, I've never seen someone act like that. I've never it's like, seen it's someone It's like being in acting stay- school. It was definitely being in acting school, but it was also looking at someone's craft and being like, oh, okay, I don't, I don't think I can do that, actually. Yep, nope, not, not there. Like, she was able to be in an emotional space for days on end, days on end, and be completely plugged into the core of that scene, to the stakes or to the circumstances of the scene. Like, I remember the courtroom scene where she could just lose her kids and holy shit like it was intense and I remember I just felt like she do this thing which was really intimidating which is before her scene she turned to me as a lawyer and asked me some law type questions <laughs> are you serious well I just to thought, get into like get yes! into the oh my god <laughs> That is hilarious. I would literally shit in my pants every you time. You were like, I'm me. as much of a lawyer as I am a cook. <laughs> so what would um, you do? And what did you do well, to like get into the into the groove? I mean, I was just fi- I just felt like I was faking it the entire time. But I had sat in on in family court for months before that, like just to do my research. But, you know, I don't remember. I don't, like at that moment, you don't remember anything. You just see like, 
just it all goes see. out of the window when you <laughs> then a sitting in front like, of Nicole Kidman. Bleed, bleed the fifth. I, I don't know. <laughs> First of all, thankfully I'm an incompetent lawyer, so I really don't know. <laughs> You're um, like, luckily, can I plead the fifth as a lawyer? As well? can, can I plead? The fifth? <laughs> but um. I did. Like, I, I definitely feel like my own acting changed after seeing and being with Nicole. Like, the way she is able to take in what other actors are doing and then ask the director when it's her, when the camera's on her, to adjust their performance to get something out of her. Like, I didn't even think you could do that. You know, and I still use that technique when, you know, when they're done and when the camera's on me, I will as a director to change what they're doing, just try different things so that it gets different reactions. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, both of them were, it's, it's an extraordinarily um, beautiful, spiritual, anyway, it's fantastic. Yeah. Look, you know, you've, um, you've done all these incredible shows now and they're obviously on these ott platforms like netflix amazon Mm -hmm. um disney plus hbo HBO, exactly um and it seems to be kind of a shift from you know the movie world which you had with with bollywood how do you i mean is this sort of now just the direction things are going to go in um that it's i mean there are lots of different ways to tell stories now, and therefore there are diff- lots of different stories being told. And so I see more and more, you know, I, I remember when Big Little Lies came out, I was doing, I did an NPR interview, and I distinctly remember the uh, interviewer, she was like, my name in Big Little Lies was Katie Richmond, and she was like, Katie Richmond? How do you get a role like Katie Richmond? And back then, it was before everything. It was before the Black Lives Matter movement, before a huge racial reckoning. But I think the implicit desire is how do you how do you get a white person's role? Hmm. How do you, a person of color, bag a white person's role? Clearly, a white person's role, right? Katie Richmond. And I think what is really an interesting thing for me to ask is how do I, person of color working in America, get to play a character called Nalini Vishwakumar in an American context? Like that's the shift that I am mind blown by versus the Katie Richmond's mm-hmm. shift, you know? How is it possible that we've come so far that I can play something so close to me? In a lead. In a lead, exactly. That blows my mind. And I realized, and I I did articulate this once, I was like, you know, there's always this feeling like, oh, growth comes outside of your comfort zone. But I never explored my comfort zone. I don't even know what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, So for me, my growth over the last few months, years is just uh, looking at my own comfort zone, seeing what I'm about, seeing what... Thriving in it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I love it. I'm like, that's the headline. Like, it's it's not the other stuff. It's not the white character anymore. It's like, damn, I'm or you know, I'm I'm I start a movie in in a week, and um, uh, I'm one of the leads, and we're just just changing it to an Indian name. Like, it's not acceptable. Whoa. It's not desirable for me to have a white person's name that ends in Stein anymore. It's not it's not what I want. Not what I want for my career anymore. And you've been um, really like vocal about this, I know, on mm-hmm, Instagram mm-hmm. and Twitter, and it's amazing. Um, you know, there's this, it's the, the, you've been a part of this cultural shift that's happening in America right now, and mm-hmm. you make no bones about, you know, how you feel about it. And obviously, you're seeing the shift even in the roles you're getting, and you're being able to, you know, I talk about this when I get asked oh, what's it like being a woman restaurateur or being, you know, and I'm like, firstly, I don't know what it's like being a male restaurateur, but um, (laughs) I'm like, look, whatever, you know, if that gender sort of box that has to be ticked is what's getting me a seat at the table, I'll grab it and then I'll do what I want with it when I'm there, you know, and that's the thing. And and Mm -hmm. I think that there is, there's a bigger shift happening where we're not being asked these sort of questions as much about, 
oh, you know, like you're a woman in a man's world. And, you know, there's this, it's still, it's mm-hmm. still there. It's not, it's mm-hmm. not, mm-hmm. you know, what, what you're seeing in the States, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it's definitely mm-hmm. becoming a thing where we don't say, oh, you know, female restauranter and whatever, you're a restauranter. But you've mm-hmm. been, you know, you're seeing this happen in your craft and you're seeing this mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. huge, like, you know, earth shattering sort of shift happening in in the states yeah but do you still so does that mean that you're not getting these stereotypical roles anymore or is that does that still happen and you have to kind of you know choose not to do that is it sort of do you see that change happening when it comes oh it happened real quick oh it happened real quick yeah I mean it it happened in different ways really quick I mean the you know the BLM just completely changed casting. You know, there are some instances that they were like traditionally white stories. Like there's a story that's coming out. It's it is a biopic, and it's it's a very it's a very white world. And I can tell that they're just trying to insert people of color into it just mm-hmm. to meet the moment. Whereas the truth is, it just feels fake because it just does. But it's impossible for me to think that the movies coming out. Now, after, you know, after after this movement and the shows coming out now aren't a hundred times more diverse than than they were in terms of, you know, and what was really pointed out is that the lead is always white and, you know, everyone around them, everyone around the first two leads, you know, the first two leads are white. But I, that's, I think that's changed. I think it's like um, really bad practice to have a uh, a white cast, an all white cast or a majority white cast or only white cast in the lead at this point and have the supporting characters be of color. I think it's it's just very poor form and called out right away. But you, like, you, you've at, been vocal about this even when it comes to, you know, the awards like Emmys and Grand, uh, you know, oh uh, uh, Oscars and things. And God. yeah, and it's still happening though. So how, I mean, how does that interplay with what you're actually seeing on the sets? I mean, you still have people who, you know, aren't getting their due and there's, you know, it's like this tokenism happening when you give, you know, a black person an award or you, so is that sort of really, is this shift for real? It has to be for real. I think we're demanding that it be for real. I don't think we're asking anymore. Mm. I think I felt the same way during Nirbhai. I don't think we're asking anymore. I think I don't think we're politely asking for justice anymore. I think we're demanding it. And I, I really felt the same energy with this racial reckoning. We're not asking nicely anymore. Yeah. I'm I'm very I'm very blunt in my interactions. I'm very blunt in my conversations with my management and and, and then they to the studios and this work has started again. So the you know, I'm seeing what comes in and it's definitely more diverse than it was last year, the 100% or, or two years ago. Um, what hasn't really changed is like, you know, the decision makers are still, it's still mm. a lot of white men, like that hasn't changed. Or I mean, the fact that the Golden Globes, I mean, I that was so ridiculous that that's why there was a bit of an outrage around. It was so, so what's happening is unless you call them out, they're not changing, which is the part that right. I don't understand. Like, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you listen to what, you know, everyone's asking you to do and change without being singled out. But, you know, I think that's a part that I don't, I don't understand. But have you ever, have you ever um, had backlash for being this vocal about, you know, whether in meetings or on social media or anywhere? Oh, sure. Sure. Of course. Yeah. It goes with the territory. Yeah. I don't really read my uh, comments though. I don't, <laughs> I don't interact with social media in, in, in ways that I think, some people do, I, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's that thing. And then I, um, it's my activism outside of social media that is more meaningful to me um, than anything else. But um, sure, there's, why, why? You have an opinion and people have opinions back and your opinion can, should change depending on the feedback you get. Why, why wouldn't it, you know? But anyway, it's, um, yeah. the racial reckoning that's happening is definitely trickling down. And That's we, amazing. we are, we just don't want to settle for anything else. Like I don't want to see a movie with, with white people anymore. I'm done <laughs> with that. I'm done supporting it. I'm done, um, you know, just letting that go. 
That's amazing. Um, okay, I want to ask you, you know, if you have for younger artists who are obviously, you know, it's a struggle you before you make it um, to where you are today. And there's increased competition, there's dirty politics. Um, you're working with a bunch of sort of young artists on Never Have I Ever. And what would you say to a larger group of, you know, younger aspirants? What would be your message to them about sort of making it? And I think when I look at someone like Maitre, you know, the thing I, that I never was at her age, which is she's very much in her own skin and her journey into her own skin began really early you know, and um, I think that's the thing that's so attractive about her. Like she is that all the time um, and unapologetic about so many things, you know, uh, and owns so much of herself. I think, uh, and, and when I see someone's art, what I look for is for them to show up completely, completely and not keep anything from me. You know, I think, again, that was the most beautiful thing about Nearby is that we all were forced to show up as ourselves. And that was really painful and hard, but it is a huge lesson on you got to show up authentically. So I, I, I think, you know, there's so much emphasis on all this other thing, like how you look and, you know, how you present yourself and how you like screw that, like figure out how to be in your own skin and whatever journey that is for you. For me, it was, it was definitely earn, um, owning the fact that I had been sexually assaulted and that had kept me from participating so much in my own body, in my own narrative, in my own just sense of self or sense of belonging um, to myself and in the world. Um, and, you know, it's it's whatever narrative you are not totally owning, you need to journey into that. That's, that, that is my advice for all people, but specifically of artists. Your art lies uh, where the wound is. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay, I'm going to take you through a couple of questions. One word answer, you know, Purna. I hate, I literally to, hate this you stuff. Have to. I, All know, right. I know, that's why I'm doing it. Um, All but right. no. <laughs> okay, what's your comfort food? Something you can eat every day. Obviously not something made by you, I'm guessing. <laughs> I mean, I want to say Thayar Sadam, which is um, South Indian yogurt rice, but I don't know if that's entirely truthful. Um, Come on, there must be something that you beg Azad to make when you're just... Like every day, it probably is Tarsadam. Oh, okay, fair. The South Indian in you. <laughs> Who's your favorite oh. actor or actress of all time? Michaela Cole is my all-time idol. Oh my Cannot God. believe her. Talk about owning everything. And I, my best friend, Sarita Chaudhary, is my, uh, yeah. my best friend and definitely someone I really look up to. And, you know, oh, that's another thing I tell artists. You know, I don't, like, she doesn't and I don't. We don't, we don't show up for work without having worked for hours together on, on it. Like, whether it's an audition, whether it's a scene, whether it's a whole movie. I've seen you do There's, that. I've seen you guys yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. We do like at least two hours a day and that's it. Like get someone and work on stuff together. Uh, don't work it. You don't, don't go at it alone. Amazing. Um, your all time favorite movie and how many times have you binge watched it? A hundred percent. It's E.T. Oh, hundred <laughs> percent. And when I was younger, I apparently watched it as much like it would finish and I'd start again <laughs> and older, maybe once a year. Wow. Yeah. Worst audition ever. <laughs> My worst audition is I was, uh, it was a movie called noise. It cracks me up and um, they wouldn't have put the scene in now. It was a couple of years ago, but it, one of the scenes was a very intense sex scene, which it's very hard to do an audition, but not only was a sex scene, it was an orgy. So it's, <laughs> I, it's just a hard audition scene. It's just, it's just hard, but they are talking and they're kind of being funny and they're whatever. Right. So I do first round and I'm, you know, I'm sitting on a chair, but like, is this when you, you know, were whatever. like, I'll do porn if I have to. Yeah, no, no, it wasn't. I was like, it was, it was a perfectly <laughs> interesting movie. I, I liked it. 
And then I go, you know, the first round is great. Second round is with uh, maybe director is great. Third round is with producers. And the fourth round is with the actor um, who happened to be Ryan Gosling. And um, this entire time I'm in a chair doing the scene and Ryan Gosling picks me up and throws me against the wall and starts making out with me. Oh, and that was your worst audition? And I, I don't know if you've ever seen this aspect of me. When I get nervous, I start giggling <laughs> uncontrollably. You like, did not. Uncont- you did not do that. Did you just like screw up an audition with Ryan Gosling? I oh was my god, Puna! Oh my god! I was invited I'm back to you. that. I'm unfriending you. I started giggling and I couldn't stop. And I got for a second, I got a glimpse of the producers and their faces were horrified oh my god and I couldn't say any of my lines I couldn't do anything I was just giggling I you, I don't know if you've seen me in a giggling fit I don't know because it's it's not like complete I obviously don't control. make you nervous <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes I'm not intimidated enough but um I started giggling and Ryan got while making out with Ryan Gosling and um the year was 2003 I still remember the the the, the trauma oh my God. and I went downstairs and I sat on the curb I've never been asked back to that casting office by the way Shocking. I sat on the curb and I was laughing like laughing hysterically and then Sarita comes because it's literally only two girls um who are testing with Ryan Gosling me and Sarita and I tell her what he did and she's like go f- Ryan Gosling so she goes up she grabs Ryan she throws him against the wall then he grabs her throws her and she loses it like a white girl has to get that role neither of us book it (laughs) so Lisa said she f***ing lost it (laughs) so Lisa lost it I completely blew it this is gold this is pure gold This literally, this white girl had to step up into the role and and do it. We, as brown girls, didn't have what it takes. You just hampered the brown girl movement, right? Yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah. We just totally cut it short. (laughs) Cut it short. Okay, what's your biggest achievement that you sort of cherish the most? Uh, Definitely Nirbhaya. Uh, The fact that, you know, my organizational skills are stellar. (laughs) Um, and somehow it happened and it came together. And yeah, I think telling my truth in front of the world and having uh, being joined on stage with four other unbelievable women and two other actors was the biggest achievement. I can believe that. Mm-hmm. Okay. And last but not least, what's oh. your definition of success? Oh, that's a hard one. I don't know. It's a, it's a really hard one. It's absolutely not connected to the usual stuff. Um, Is it even connected to your, to your craft? My idea of success is uh, feeling complete, feeling like you've said what you are here to say. Yeah, your purpose. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely it's very connected to Azad and Anav and um, love and being loved, but also being witnessed is a, is a big thing uh, and witnessing. Yeah, something like that. That is amazing. And speaking of Azad and Anav, hi, boys. <laughs> and a big hug to everyone out there in LA. Well, we, we can't. I don't know if you know, we, we went out. For dinner today, after a year. What? Yeah, Azad and Av. Azad and I like, I'm not cooking for you anymore. <laughs> I, we, I thought, when, you know, if I, I, I thought you would say your definition of success is just cooking a, a, a complete meal for your family. <laughs> that would be I mine. Have literally done it. I promise I've done it. Okay. Um, yeah, we went out today. Wow. We sat in a restaurant outdoor, but it was unbelievable. Oh my God, you're bad for my business. You should have been going <laughs> out like ages ago. <laughs> but is it is it restaurants have just opened and that's what's... Um, I mean, we're both vaccinated. I think that's yeah. really it. I think we just passed the mark for like having it. And, oh, felt good. Wow. Wow. Big moment, right? Big moment. A year later. Amazing. 
listen, this has been a riot and um, amazing. And I'm so glad we finally did this. So thank you, thank you, thank you for making the time and slotting me in between all your crazy, amazing gigs. Um, we, we can't wait. I can't wait to binge watch the second season. I'm oh, so I cannot excited. wait for you to see it. It's so juicy. Oh my God. Amazing. Listen, congratulations. And Thank you. Bigger and better things for you, I hope. And um, lots and lots of love. And congratulations on this podcast. And I'll call you right after. Big love. <laughs> okay. Bye. 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 I have literally seen Purna grow as an artist over the last 10 years. And I feel like I got to know a completely different side to her today and what it takes to get better each day. Don't forget to catch her on the second season of Never Have I Ever coming up soon on Netflix. I hope you enjoyed tuning in today. Do catch the earlier episodes when you get a chance. And more importantly, I would love to hear from you with your thoughts on the show. You can find me on Instagram at Gauri Devideal or on Twitter at Gauri Details or LinkedIn. Either way, sit back and relax because this round is on me. Do you know Tamil? Tamil Purima. Do your children enjoy great stories that inculcate good values? Hi, I am Ravishankar Balachandran and I host the Storytime Tamil podcast. I am excited to share a short story with great moral values every day. Listen to Storytime Tamil on the IBM podcast app, YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts from. पेश खिदमत है आपकी शान में हमारे अंजुमन से हाय आई एम सदफ एंड आई एम अर्शद खाने का इतिहास इकोनॉमिक्स पॉलिसी साइकोलॉजी सब है मेन्यू पर ओनली ऑन द नानकाली पॉडकास्ट एवरी वेंसडे सिर्फ आईवीएम पॉडकास्ट ऐप या वेबसाइट पर या फिर जहां से भी आप अपने पॉडकास्ट सुनते हो